This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He is the son of one of country music's most notable tenors. Hank Adam Lachlan joins us to talk about his dad, Hank Lachlan, and a new documentary about his life on this edition of Conversations. Hank Lachlan was born and raised in the backwoods of Northwest Florida. He learned to play and sing in a small country church, the beginnings of which would ultimately take him from McClellan, Florida to 116 Fifth Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, the mother church of country music. From Nashville, Tennessee, the country music capital of the world, here's the 1101st consecutive performance of radio's oldest living broadcast, the Grand Ole Opry, tonight starring Hank Lachlan. Please help me, I'm falling in love Hank Lachlan's voice was, the only way you can say it, it was a great gift from God. He was so unique. He, he was so, so pure. His voice was just so high and so, so rich and so emotional. He just had everything in his voice that a singer should have. Great range, you know, great pitch. Hank was known for always being able to deliver. You know, he never let you down. He never had a shaky performance. He was as solid as you could, could get. I don't know what he did to keep his voice in such great shape but his voice stayed really high and very clear way up until the end of his life and career. It's a big tenor. They don't last long. It, sound, it sounds, in his youth, it sounds like it's gonna give out at any minute. And he, he sings to 91. When I first heard him, I just thought his tone was so beautiful, you know. That's the best you could ask for as a singer, is to have a voice like that, a song like, Please Help Me, I'm Falling, and Send Me the Pillow That You Dream On. Well, it don't get much better than that for singing and playing country music now, does it? Please help me, I'm falling in love with you. Amazing story about your father. Uh, what a career he had. How, how did this documentary come about, Hank? My uh, cousin, Bobby Lachlan, who lives over in Milton, over in Santa Rosa County, called me a couple of years ago and he said that he had heard from Mary Riker here at WSRE. And she was uh, trying to locate someone in our family to uh, discuss the possibility of doing a, a documentary. And uh, he gave me her number and I called her. And it just so happened that my fiance and I were going to be down in Pensacola Beach not uh, too terribly long after that conversation. And they, uh, Mary and a good friend of hers met us over, over on the beach over there. And we, we uh, uh, hung out and, and kind of, uh, she had a very nice uh, sort of a treatment that she laid out. And, and I thought it was a, a, a wonderful thing. And I, I thought, well, yes, uh, absolutely. When she asked if we would, uh, be in favor of it, yeah. so that's how that began. Yeah. It's a gr it's a great story, and and the documentary is full of some marquee names. I mean, Vince Gill, Dolly Parton, uh, Marty Stewart's in there. Uh, who am I missing? Uh, Charlie Bill, Pryan. Yeah. Bill Anderson. Bill Anderson. Jimmy all these. Sealing, <laughs> yeah. Ray Stevens. I mean, just just you know, Buddy Cow, yeah. helper. Yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. just a, a, a bunch of great. Uh, did your dad work with all these folks along the way? Uh, <clears throat> Most of them, yes, every one. Ladies and gentlemen, Hank Lachlan, give him a nice big round of applause. Hello, Jimmy. Good to see you. I don't think you'll find anybody here that wouldn't want to talk about Hank and say good things about him because he was he was our friend. He was our our uh, co-worker, our our companion, compatriot, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a wonderful man. Yeah, we miss him here. I always will believe that he was one of the greatest that was 
ever on the stage at the opera. I would put him up there with the people like Hank Williams and uh, Ann Kitty Wells and Roy Acuff and all the greats, you know, that really meant something, that really added to the quality and the depth, not just as a good singer, but just as good people. I was completely just uh, blown mystified away. and yeah. blown away that this group of people, all the way to Dad's contemporaries yeah. and those in the middle, that yeah. uh, he had either worked with or somehow influenced, yeah. Yeah. and that was quite a that was quite a joy. It it, uh, it gave us pause. It was a, a quite a nice thing for them to do. I, I, I can't believe they did it, but it was very sweet of them to do it. Yeah, you know the the thing that I thought was just ran through and through the documentary, and 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 especially from Vince Gill was just what a nice guy your father was, and how he seemed to help his fellow artists and all. And so I know that makes you I know it makes you feel feel great. What was it like growing up with Hank Lachlan? Uh, well, <clears throat> I enjoyed it. He was a lot of fun. He liked to fish and uh, get out and hunt and stuff, and uh, we'd we'd go and and. It's uh, probably not, uh, well, it's not what's going on these days with raising kids, but I grew up with BB guns and 410 shotgun. Going over to the, we had a little lake over there with brim and catfish and things like that. And uh, so I grew up in the country. And uh, right around my time, he was still ranching cattle a little bit. And uh, he, he, uh, we had the Singing L Ranch out in McLellan. So it was, it was just fun. It was great. I felt like I was on the Ponderosa. Right. You know. and, and then he would just go from time to time into Nashville to the Grand Ole Opry or do a show or something. Oh, sure. He, would he was touring quite a bit back in those days, so he would be gone maybe um, seven months out of the year, but he'd break it up. And, uh, and then, yes, we were back and forth up to Nashville. And uh, you know, I remember in those days he was still recording quite a bit with RCA at the time. Right, right. And then, and I was small enough to where I, I, there were details I can't remember, but I do certainly remember the big things. I remember the uh, Ryman Auditorium, how dark the alley was behind it, and it was scary. It was very scary, and I remember how crowded it would be back there in, in those days. I was a very small child. Right. And then uh, I remember Opryland and going to Opryland at the brand new Opry House, and, right. and, it, and it was a lot of fun, but right. uh, I had no idea about the business or, or, or anything like that. But uh, uh, but another fun uh, trivia fact about our little uh, farm lake out there is we had a we had an alligator. <laughs> it was an alligator. Daddy named him Charlie. The the gator had three legs, and obviously had been in a scrap with another bigger gator, <laughs> and decided he might better leave that big big lake and come on over to our little one. But uh, we had a lot of fun with those things and uh, and all that. But it was uh, the memories are nothing but uh, fond and. And I, cher I, I cherish them. It sounds like you had a real balanced life as opposed to, to living in the spotlight, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned RCA Records, so he recorded a lot and had, had some albums produced by Chet Atkins. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in any of that, or was that No, I wasn't born then, okay. but <laughs> when he was signed, Steve Scholl signed him to RCA in 1954. And then uh, Steve had signed Elvis Presley the next year away from Sun Records. And uh, so Steve was the big executive that handled the country division for uh, General Sarnoff, who was the head of all of all of in, all of RCA, RCA right. which also owned NBC, the right. television network. Right. And uh, Mr. Scholes was daddy. My father always referred to him as his daddy in the business. Right. After Pappy Daly back in Houston, Texas, when Dad was on Four Star, when Dad went with RCA to the real, real big, big, big time. Right. Uh, Mr. Scholes was uh, quite an influence on him, and he put Chet, Chet was an artist on RCA, and uh, Mr. Scholes had Chet become, he hired him to be an executive and to be his assistant down in Nashville. So that's when Chet became the A&R assistant, a, a, I guess you would call him the vice president of A&R. Right. But at those times in the middle 50s on up through the late 50s, Steve Scholes was very much producing those sessions on my father and the other artists that were on RCA at the time, like Eddie Arnold, Don Gibson, Jim Reeves, Skeeter Davis, and uh, the list goes on and on. Um, a remarkable, he had such foresight. Uh, yeah. You have to credit him with everything that RCA Victor wound up doing, not only in the country music field, but in the pop field. 
because of Elvis Presley. Right. And mm -hmm. Mr. Scholl's reach went, uh, it, it, it extended far beyond any just two uh, genres. Right. If he liked somebody in the jazz world, he could sign them. Uh, the Red Seal RCA records that some of the folks out there watching might remember was the classical music. And uh, if, if he heard a particular uh, symphonic group, why he would bring them in and have someone record them up in New York or in Chicago at one of the big studios. But he was quite a man, and that's who, that's who signed him. And he produced Dad's first uh, several hits. And through 1957 with Sammy the Pillar, A Little More Like Heaven, Geisha Girl and all that, but Chet Atkins was in those sessions. Mm -hmm. And, and on a lot of those early sessions, not only uh, before Chet was actually listed as producer, producer, he was actually a session player on those. Right. And then became his primary producer starting from about late 57 until uh, they all left RCA in the mid 70s. Your dad had a lot of appeal, not just in the US, but in Europe. What, was, what, what do you think a secret was that made him so popular in Europe? I don't know. Um, I've asked him that before. We, we, we had a conversation in his office a few times once I was older. Mm -hmm. And um, he visited there in 1957 the first time on a package trip that RCA had put together with uh, the Browns, Jim Ed, Maxine, and Bonnie. And uh, Dale, Dale Wood was on that trip. She was a wonderful pianist. Jim Reeves, and I believe I don't think Skeeter Davis was on that trip, but they went, and Chet Atkins was on it, so they went all over Germany, and and uh, I don't know if they came into Spain, they may have, but they went all through the UK and Germany and that area, and uh, <clears throat> while he was in the UK, excuse me, he met, uh, they sort of tiptoed into Ireland, and he, he met some of the Irish folks and all the English folks, and uh, you know Germany, and he felt right at home over with all of those people. He, Dad, being an Aquarius, born in February, he was naturally uh, he could never be tied into one particular category. Right. He had to explore. Uh, being the fire sign, they have to get out and really explore new things to keep from being bored. So I think the lack of uh, the just the the idea of new horizons is what drew him to them, and the fact that they knew he was sincere about it was what drew them to right. him. Right. And uh, you know, he had a <clears throat> very nice, clear Irish tenor voice, right. and I think that uh, they enjoyed that. Yeah. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Slim Whitman, the late Slim Whitman, who right. is also from down in southern Florida. Slim Whitman was the first one that took country music over into that part of England uh, about a year or so before dad went over and uh, but uh, yeah he he, uh, he was very successful over in that part of the country globally with the help of C RCA Victor all of his records were for sale in about every continent Wow and so that that in and of itself helped give him a leg up when it came to touring the world and he did Tokyo everywhere all of Europe uh, Canada and uh, so on and so forth. You, you, you mentioned the tenor voice and one of the things they talked about in the documentary and of course we know from, from seeing him perform you know, before he passed away was that voice was, it was there right <clears> to the <throat> end, huh? I mean it was, it was he, he didn't seem to lose anything, huh? Dad took care of his voice. He could not stand smoke filled rooms and when he was performing overseas, uh, especially in the ballrooms, that bothered him, but he would never say anything about it. But he never smoked, and uh, he took care of his voice, and he, he did everything he could to maintain the gift that uh, the good Lord gave him. Right. So it was just a matter of pure the luck of the Irish, as they say, and uh, from some help up above, but he uh, he kept it all the way, all the way until the last time he sang, and I think that well he was 90 years old the last time I heard him sing, and that was at his no excuse me, the last time I heard him sing was at his 91st birthday in Bruton, Alabama, where we lived over right. in Bruton, not far from where the old ranch uh, was, and he we picked up a guitar and and we sang and and he could still do it. And that was uh, about a month before he passed away.
Wow. What, what was the last, what, what year was his last performance on the Grand Ole Opry? That would have been 2007, okay. September, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And you performed with him? I did. Uh, what was that like? It was a, a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I sure did. I, I was very shy about those things because uh, working in the, the business side of the music industry, uh, I didn't want to step out of line and, and but then I started realizing that was ridiculous. That wasn't stepping out of line. That was having some fun and making music. Right. Uh, so uh, it was a real treat and joy. And it, uh, hey, there's there's nothing in all of our lives together that I can look back and wish we'd have been able to have done because we literally tried to uh, to do everything we could creatively together. And and uh, I believe we succeeded. I'm most grateful for that. Right. Because you, opportunities. Because you, you produced a couple of records for him, right? I did. Yeah. And and if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken, was one uh, the Irish songs? No, sir. You, that, okay. that was, uh, well, he had a song called, uh, he had an album called Irish Songs Country Style, right. which was from RCA in oh. 1963. Okay. Uh, I did not. He made... He made two albums in England and Ireland in the ni late 1970s okay. with all of the Irish and uh, British musicians, session musicians. I had nothing to do with those, but okay. the last two albums we did were in uh, 2001 and 2005 and 6. Uh, the first one was a country record, and we, we, uh, we cut some of his earlier hits like Sim of the Pillow You Dream On, and Dolly Parton sang with him on that one. And then we cut Danny Boy and Vince Gill sang with him on that. And then uh, some newer songs that uh, were, that I, uh, that I thought and we all thought kind of lent to his, his voice as a tenor. Mm -hmm. And the musicians were fabulous. The last album we did was a gospel album called By the Grace of God. He wrote uh, every song on the album with the exception of some, uh, what we like to call sort of, uh, good old homecoming gospel songs that we did at the end acoustically uh, that uh, we wanted to throw in, like uh, Have a Little Talk with Jesus, Milky, My Milky White Way, and just some old, old gospel standards. And, and Amazing Grace, he did that a cappella on the album. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, to mention those, all the musicians that he'd worked for just about from the RCA days and later on when the, he was with MGM for an album, uh, they uh, they came back, the ones that were still playing, and playing brilliantly, I might add, and it was uh, just like old times. The Jordanaires, mm -hmm. they were background vocals for us. So, uh, you know, that being said, those two albums were, I think, a, a pretty doggone good exclamation point on a very, very long and fruitful career. Yeah, amazing, amazing. As you were growing up, did you have, because as you kind of mentioned earlier, you're, you're more on the uh, business side of the music industry and uh, law, et cetera. Yes, sir. But um, did you ever, did you sing a lot as a kid growing up? Did you sing and play? And I did, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd go out with them when I was three years old. I had a ukulele <laughs> and walk out and sing with them on the Opry. I didn't sing much. I'd just stand there and uh, think I was singing. <laughs> but I knew to look out the audience and yeah. I knew to look up at him. And when it was over, we'd go and take a little bow and go yeah. off. And, yeah. But uh, Dolly Parton one time, and I was maybe four years old, and I remember it vividly. It was at the New Opry House, and she uh, she and Porter were still together right. uh, as a duet. And she asked me, she said, well, what are you going to sing tonight? Because I love Dolly, and I, I just sure. loved her. I, every time I see her, I go running over and saying, hey, hello, and she was such a doll and lovely, lovely, wonderful woman. Uh, that, for some reason, when she asked me what I was going to sing, I never knew what a stage fright was. But I got <laughs> stage fright, and it happened to me at four years old, and I didn't want to go out. Wow. And I wouldn't, and she took me, she actually took me out there, and I held her hand, and I only would go if, if, if she would hold my hand. She took me out there and, and uh, with Dad, and then I stood with him. And when we finished, I got back, and I, I told him, I said, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> and uh, never never messed with it at all. But, yeah, I played the drums and the guitar and have written songs, and I've performed uh, with him and other times around the places and stuff and uh so i enjoy that yeah yeah man talk about your dad as a songwriter sure 
tell, tell, tell me a little bit about, first of all, tell the audience some of the songs that he wrote that we would know, number one, and then what kind of songwriter was he? He was the only one he had when he started. He didn't know that there were other people out there writing songs that you could go and have them pitch them to you to record. So uh, his, big, his first big record was Same Sweet Girl that he had written in the late 40s. That was his first hit. And then he followed that up with a, a bunch of regional hits around the, the West Coast and uh, Pacific Northwest. So from everywhere from the uh, west side of Chicago on over, he was, he was hitting pretty good with those things. And uh, Pinball Millionaire was sort of a novelty tune that he had, but then uh, Down Texas Way and some Western swing songs like that. Um, Simon the Pillia Dream On was, yeah. was first, uh, he, he wrote that in 1949 and uh, had his first hit uh, regionally with it in, in those days. And then, uh, you know, but he, he had written so many of those songs. So every hit he was having in those charts out in, in that area were all of his songs. Uh -huh. And he finally broke the national big time in 1953 with a song that he didn't write, but the gentleman to whom he was under contract did, and it was called Let Me Be The One. Actually, uh, the fellow that, uh, he had his name on the song, but it was the two other writers who actually wrote it. He, had, he just had his name on it. But it was Let Me Be The One, and it was a huge number one record, and that's what brought him to the Grand Ole Opry as a guest the first time. Right. Yeah. And he eventually became a member of the Grand Ole Opry. He did, seven Opry. years later. And for people who don't know, what that, I mean, that's a big deal. Explain what being a, versus just performing on the Grand Ole Opry right. versus being a member of the Grand Ole Opry. Yes, sir. Uh, that was the ultimate. That's where any artist in country and western music, as they called it back in those days, wanted to go, to the Grand Ole Opry. Right. And then to be asked to be a member that was that was just it. Yeah. There was, I mean, that was the top of the ladder. Right. And uh, they made he was made a member of the Opry in November, November twelfth, nineteen sixty. And uh, we have the actual tape of that night, that evening, okay. when he was made a member. Chad Atkins was on the show with him, and they they held the whole half hour of that with with Dad hosting it. Right. But that was it. That was the biggest honor that anyone could ever have in country music is become a member of the Grand Ole Opry. Right. And, and exactly what does that mean? What do, what, do they, what do you get for that? Well, you know, the membership in those days, first and foremost, it was, a, it was the biggest uh, promotional uh, venue there was. And if you understand that in those days you only had maybe 50 radio stations that played country music full time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're limited, but with the Grand Ole Opry and its clear channel, mm -hmm. people heard an artist singing his or her hit record, and it went all over the place. That's right. So it was the mega promotional uh, tool for a record company and an artist, yeah. and it helped with their personal appearances. So the, if you're a big star, Grand Ole Opry, and you're out there and they're listening to you, then your booking agent, it's a lot easier for that person to book appearances and then you're working 200, 300 days a year. Yeah. If you want to work 300 days a year, you could if you got a hit record. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to I digress, but I saw your interview with William Lee Golden and the Oak Ridge Boys up until uh, all of the stuff that's happened in the last several years. They tour tremendously. Mm -hmm. To this day, they are just touring and selling out. Yeah. So it's a... But back to that, it was the biggest promotional tool. Yeah, yeah, and and you know you and made... and an honor, that of which is indescribable. Absolutely. If I may finish, sorry to interrupt. Sure. But these people like that, they were listening to the Grand Ole Opry on the radio when they were kids. Mm -hmm. That's where they wanted to go. That's right. You know, they heard Roy Acuff, right? Mm -hmm. Ernest Tubb. Yeah. Uh, you know, Uncle Uncle Dave Macon, who was the banjo player, yeah. and I could go on and on and on about yeah. that. But uh, I might tell the uh, uh, encourage the audience that if uh, if if you've not uh, researched the Opry in the early days, please do. Yeah. 
it's a unique history, and I think you'll enjoy reading up on it. Yeah, it, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. It's a marvelous story, and just to kind of follow up on what you were saying. I hope it, I answered your question. It, <laughs> well, but talking about what a huge deal it was, I mean, in today's world, we have, you know, satellite radio and so on and sure. so forth, but if you think about the, the clear channel like you were talking right. about, so at night what happened is you could hear 650 WSM across half the nation, you know, Very and, much so. And, and so that was a, that was a big deal. That was a, that was a huge <clears> deal. <throat> and, oh, wow. uh, coming out of Nashville there. I've got about two, two and a half minutes left here. Um, sure. What do you hope this documentary, what's what's the the takeaway from it? What do you, what do you hope uh, viewers get from the documentary? First of all, uh, that they enjoy it. Uh, all of the production staff here at WSRE have gone above and beyond. Uh, Mary Riker and Emily Hudson, Ted and James, and, and, and if I'm leaving out anyone, forgive me. But they have gone above and beyond and have interviewed and interviewed, written and written uh, the graphics that were involved with all this and the editing. Uh, I hope they enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, this was a labor of love on their on their behalf. And and I first uh, the first time I've ever seen it was just a couple of uh, evenings ago when they had a special viewing, yeah. and. Uh, it just knocked me out. It was a, such an emotional and and uh, uh, heart lifting experience to see that. So that's number one. Secondly, um, if uh, you know, it's nice that there's there's a, this this being an avenue for him to be remembered, yeah. and maybe they might decide to dig in and and go and and uh, find out a little bit more about him and his music and. And if they do, that'd be great. And, uh, they might want to record some of his songs. <laughs> they might want to do that, and that's yeah. that's really great and good. But the biggest thing is uh, is that uh, I just uh, am very grateful that this uh, came along because it's very sweet for him to be remembered, and we're most grateful. Yeah. Hank Adam, it was a real pleasure talking with you. you you're, too, Jeff. you're a gentleman much like your dad. Thank you, sir. I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, and, and and you will enjoy the documentary. The folks here at WSRE did a phenomenal job of putting it together, and Hank was such a gentleman, and, and like I mentioned before, I mean, there are people in this documentary like Dolly Parton, Vince Gill, Bill Anderson is in there, uh, Dwight Yoakam, that's what oh, yeah. we left out, uh, Marty Stewart, uh, Ralph Emery, we were talking about WSM 650, he used to be the late night radio guy and the Grand Ole Opry mm -hmm. announcer on 650 WSM out of Nashville. Great story, you'll absolutely love it. And by the way, you can watch the documentary about Hank Lachlan. It's entitled Country Music's Timeless Tenor, and it will be online at WSRE.org. And of course, it'll be airing on the station and, and perhaps other stations around as well. But uh, you can find it at WSRE.org, and you'll also find some of our conversations pretty much in the same neighborhood there, WSRE.org slash conversations as well as on YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. You know, I always close this broadcast out by saying, take good care of yourself. Well, as we tape this show in the fall of 2020, that statement has even more meaning. I do wish you the best and good health, and do take good care of yourself. We'll be seeing you soon.